Combo Dex and Pioneer have a surprisingly long history together. Since the inception of the format, Wizards has tried to balance the fun people get from playing their older cards and the power level of the format as a whole. In general, this has led to bans on combos that look to kind of infinite someone, such as the Sahili Cat combo with Felidar Guardian that ate the ban hammer in week one of Pioneer being released. Other cards with near infinite loops to them have also been taken away, such as Nexus of Fate looping with Wilderness Reclamation, or just hard to stop or in general understand combos such as Inverter of Truth, Walking Ballista Heliod, Balatru Spy, Undercity Informant, Oops All Spells style decks, or Kethis the Hidden Hands kind of pile of legendary cards Emporium combo deck. Because of all these bans, Pioneer has the perception that they don't really want combo decks floating around, which couldn't be further away from the truth. While combo decks in Pioneer are oftentimes less powerful than other Eternal formats and take a little longer to set up and require a couple more cards to utilize properly, combo decks in the format are still alive and well. There is one deck in particular which harkens back to a powerful toolbox combo deck that was banned in Modern, one that packed a couple of ways to kill somebody outright which has combo players rejoicing and other players a little up in arms. Of course, by now you've realized it's time to collect ourselves as a company and run through the Abzan Amalia combo deck, sometimes known as Explorer Combo. Now the deck itself is a creature combo deck, which already kind of gives it big birthing pod vibes and can be built with a toolbox of different creatures in its flex slots. Although at pioneer power level, a large amount of them will be related to our combo specifically and there will be less one of flex spots overall in comparison into old eternal format combos. The main game plan of the deck revolves around getting two specific creatures into play so that you can sometimes win the game outright, pending your opponent has no one tap mana available or any blockers that can survive potentially a board wipe to say. This video will go over the combo first and then head into how the deck is constructed and some lines of play. That way you understand how the combo works as you see what pilots have been including in their lists and can decide for you which ones you like best as we go over all of the options. Amalia Benavides Aguirre is the namesake card of the deck, and besides looking like a period accurate representation of Velma Dinkley on Ixalan, it's the main win condition to our deck. Amalia has a bit of protection on her own with a ward cost of paying 3 life to target her with any sort of removal spell, but her second ability is the one that can win us the game outright. Whenever you gain life, Amalia gets to explore then you must destroy all other creatures if Amalia's power is exactly 20. Doing some quick math, that means that if Amalia hits 20 power, it clears the board of any potential blockers and has exactly enough power to one-shot our opponents. But how do we get her that strong fast enough for it to be a legit combo deck? Enter Wild Growth Walker. Standard players from the pre-COVID times remember this goofy 1-3 as the way that the Golgari mid-range deck buffered its life total against Mono Red before Embercleave was around to run them over, using the explored creatures from our first romp around Ixalan to grow this elemental to big sizes and find finality aboard for it to attack through. In this deck, however, the elemental is strictly a combo enabler, gaining us three life every time we explore. This means exactly what you think it does. Having Amalia explore trigger Walker, which gains us three life, which then triggers Amalia to explore, which triggers Walker to gain us three life, and there you have it. A way to quickly get Amalia to 20 power and watch the Walker sacrifice itself to the cause. F's in the chat. Let's dissect the combo a bit more before we talk about the rest of the deck. While this loop is happening, our explorers will allow us to put lands from our library into our hand, while we get the choice of putting the rest of the cards into our graveyard or leaving them on top one by one. This means a fresh 2-2 Amalia will have, at minimum, 18 triggers in order to blow up the world, which equates to 54 life gained from Wild Growth Walker, plus one extra trigger from the Explorer Amalia does to get 20 power, putting the Walker's ability on the stack before it kaputs. Of course, 
lands won't give Amalia counters from exploring, so your life total is going to be even higher if you hit any lands while exploring, which is very likely. So for quick reference, Amalia pilots will often explore into two separate piles, lands and non-lands. Once they find a card they'd like to keep on top of their library, the loop gets simplified and shortcut. Overall, there's a handy formula you can use to track your Amalia triggers and life gain, which is 19 times 3 plus 3x, where x is the number of land you turn over when exploring, and the 19 is taken from our Wild Growth Walker triggers. The two piles help here because all the cards are revealed when exploring and the lands will go into your hand, so both players will have all the information as to how many lands your x is to multiply by. When the combo finally goes off, every creature on the board besides Amalia will be destroyed. So indestructible creatures or spells to give indestructibility will save our opponent's creatures, which makes this combo a not for sure instant win. It's also important to note that the trigger for Amalia's destruction clause is tied to the explore trigger, meaning there is no time for either player to respawn between the ability going on the stack and the Amalia board explosion. Now, there are ways for your opponents can disrupt the combo at this point, the best way being to just remove the Amalia or the walker at some point with cards like Fatal Push. Other ways include making your Wild Growth Walker indestructible so that it never actually dies to Amalia and the loop just continues forever, resulting in a drawn game. The other way for opponents to mess with your combo is by responding to the trigger on the stack while Amalia is at 19 or fewer power, and then increasing her power to 20 or higher. This will skip over Amalia's destruction clause as well, since the ability is tied to the expiration giving her 20 power and not just having 20 power period. This also results in a continuous loop, causing a drawn game. Now, the draws are where many players take issue with this deck as a whole, because the Amalia player technically doesn't have to explore a card into their graveyard if they don't want to. That means Amalia can never deck itself to its infinite explore triggers, and therefore a game will stall out. This forces said drawn game, where in a normal best of three, players will just shuffle up and start a new game, as the rules state that it is first to two wins before time in the round expires, and not the most games won out of three games. So you can play four, five, or 20 games if the round time permits it. Our combo deck, however, has two different tools inside of it that can help end games even when there's an infinite loop occurring. Dina, Soul Steeper, and Aetherflux Reservoir. Dina is the tool of choice to speed up a kill with the Amalia deck as each iteration of the loop will trigger Dina to make our opponents lose one life. So again, with a minimum of 19 triggers happening, Dina just needs one land to be explored to kill our opponents by herself without Amalia even needing to lift a finger. Dina also has a key ability to end an infinite loop by paying one mana to sacrifice a creature if need be. However, since her being alive usually kills our opponents in the first place, this is a very corner case ability to need to use when already comboing. Aetherflux Reservoir, meanwhile, gives us an outlet to use all of our life that we've gained to blast our opponents for 50 damage in the face, which kills basically any deck in the format. Again, this benefits from Wild Growth Walker's life game portion of our loop, but does require Reservoir to be in play in order to kill someone. Oftentimes, when you're going through your explore loop, you will leave the reservoir on top of your library with your explore triggers so that even if Amalia gets removed that turn, you have a backup way to kill your opponent right on top of your library by just untapping and slamming the reservoir. Now, this is all fine and dandy, but we're missing a key ingredient to our combo meal, a way to either gain life or explore while both of our pieces are on the board. It is important to note that while Amalia and Wild Growth Walker end up comboing together, they cannot trigger said loop without an a little extra help. That's why the rest of our deck is devoted to mostly light game related packages of small creatures that we can get into play ahead of our combo and some extra explore tools. Lunark Veteran has seen play in Angel's List previously, but works as a way to enable our combo by just existing on the battlefield. The Cleric has us gain life whenever a creature we control enters the battlefield, which includes Amalia and Walker, so our loop has a place to begin. 
Its disturbed side Luminous Phantom is also one of those corner cases where Dina sacrificing something or our opponent killing something can trigger the start of our own loop. Likewise, Prosperous Innkeeper is a 2 mana version of the veteran with the bonus of making a treasure when it enters, giving us the ability to pay for counter magic or play Amalia and Walker in the same turn as early as turn 3. This will also be a key factor to our spell package in just a little bit, so we'll come back to Prosperous Innkeeper then. Cenote Scout doesn't gain us life, but it does the other part of what our combo needs to start a loop by being a 1 mana explore creature. It doesn't really matter if the Merfolk stays a 1-1 one, one or not for our loops purposes, but being a 1-drop that can ensure we hit a follow-up land drop and dig a card deeper in our library isn't too shabby on its own. Sentinel of the Nameless City is not only a solid mid-range card if you need to get grindy with the game, but it also makes map tokens on entering and attacking. That means flipping into one of these larger merfolk gives you another way to start the loop of your combo by exploring just off of a token. Gilded Goose is the mana dork of choice for this list, not because it makes any color of mana, but because it can produce food tokens. Food tokens gain life when activated, which is another way to enable our combo when we have the pieces put together. Goose can repeatedly make food as well, meaning we can use it to power out the other cards with the mana it generates and then make a food when we need to combo later on. While there are other creatures in the deck, these are the ones that directly synergize with the combo part of the plan to our deck, while providing some minor value towards a normal game plan. I want to hold off on the other creatures and focus on something important for the Amalia deck as a whole, which is getting these creatures into play in either multiples or if they aren't in our hand. This spell package of our deck is what really makes it sing, as needing to naturally draw any combination of these pieces would make the deck extremely inconsistent and slow. The first spell to mention is an instant called Court of Calling, which is not only the best way to find a specific piece of our combo we might be missing, but also has Convoke to work with all of our smaller creatures that enable our combo. Even if we tap a lot of our mana, we only need a combination of five creatures and mana, three of them being able to produce green, to find either our combo pieces at instant speed. This allows us to not only Amalia blow up the world, but also allows us to do it at instant speed and untap with Amalia ready to attack. Cord also has the outside use of just finding the combo creatures as it can find missing life gain or exploring pieces to loop as well as tutoring for more of our toolboxy cards that can answer our opponent's own threats. Collected Company is the other instant speed way for the deck to throw out the combo all at once, as the deck is specifically crafted in a way that takes advantage of the three converted mana cost or less stipulation on Coco. Both our combo creatures are only two mana, and all the cards you selected to enable our loop are between one and three converted mana cost to match it. This means that we can hit any combination of them off of one collected company to all but win games at instant speed for just four mana. This happens as early as turn three thanks to cards like Gilded Goose or that Prosperous Innkeeper we mentioned earlier providing the extra mana early. Return to the ranks adds some redundancy to our deck as our opponents are most likely to have ways to kill one of the three parts of our combo we need in order to win. The inclusion of return to the ranks means that normal board wipes are not nearly as effective as control decks would like them to be as it just puts everything we need to start all over again into our graveyard to bring back for just four or five total mana. The added bonus of Convoke means that if we use any number of our 1 mana enablers to set up our combo, they can be used as a mana neutral way to return for x equals 2 to get Walker and Amalia into play to win with. Return to the ranks is also a great card to leave on top after an Amalia loop occurs, so if the opponent answers our combo the first time, we could just do it again next turn from the graveyard. Lively Dirge is a newer addition to some Amalia lists, as it pretty much combines both Court of Calling and Return to the ranks together to have another way to fish out our combo from both our deck or our graveyard. Although it is a sorcery speed spell, Lively Dirge still costs 5 total mana to get all of its modes activated, and oftentimes you will only need one part of it to be used for us to actually get benefit from it. 
The second spree mode of the card lines up perfectly with returning a Walker and a Malia to play as they total the four mana that the card limits you bringing back, and it does so for the same cost that return to the ranks would be for those two specific creatures, although without the ability to convoke for extra mana. Now, most pilots agree that the majority of the Amalia deck needs to be built around the cards we've just talked about, but there are a few wiggle room slots that you can change around. One thing you do want to keep in mind when you're deciding on what flex spots you're going to have is you really don't want to go below 28 total 3 converted mana cost or less creatures if you're running 4 collected companies. Since you want to have that sweet spot of an 85% chance on hitting 2 creatures per Coco. Some decks are down to 27, but I wouldn't suggest going any lower. Selfless Savior is the goodest of boys when it comes to saving parts of our combo in the early game, or protecting it from a fatal push when Amalia is popping off. It should be noted, however, that Selfless Savior being used on our Wild Growth Walker when the loop is initiated will cause the loop to go infinite, so only do this if you have a Dino or Reservoir already in play, lest you wind up drawing the game. Deep Cavern Bat is a creature-based Thought Seize that also has the bonus of having lifelink, which can, in a pinch, start our combo loop with an Amalia in play. It's also just a very solid way for the deck to disrupt its opponents at instant speed off of a Court of Calling or Collect Company. Likewise, Skyclave Apparition is a tutorable way to deal with hate pieces or threats your deck just can't handle at the moment, exiling things like Shieldred and Archfiend of the Draws to clear a path for some smaller attacks or keeping you alive long enough to combo off. For things larger than 4 mana, decks have been trying out Ruthless Lawbringer. At the cost of just one of our creatures, we're able to destroy any non-land permanent. This works great against not just hate pieces that stop us from playing things from our library or stopping us from gaining life, but also kills larger threats like Vein Ripper, which can really mess with life totals and math while we're looping our Amalia. Extraction Specialist is an added piece of redundancy that is in a similar vein to Return to the Ranks and Lively Dirge, except for the fact it could be hit off of Collected Company and tutored for with Court of Calling. Getting back a single piece of our combo that ate a fatal push or something else early while also providing a way to start our combo at lifelink usually sees the human in multiple copies in a deck. Honest Rutstein is a newer card to the Amalia deck that serves a very similar purpose to Extraction Specialist, but instead of having lifelink or putting a creature into play, it returns the creature to our hand and reduces the cost of all of our other creatures. Although Amalia isn't reduced due to her mana cost having no generic mana in it, the rest of our deck is lowered, allowing for us to play out multiple creatures in the following turns. Voice of the Blessed has fallen out of favor more recently, but is a way for the deck to put up multiple threats for lethal damage off of a single Amalia loop. Voice grows for each instance of life we gain, flying over the board at 4 plus 1 plus 1 counters, and becoming indestructible at 10 plus 1 plus 1 counters. Since Amalia needs to trigger at least 18 times, this means our voice will be a 2020 flying creature with a naked Amalia starting our loop that doesn't die to its own board wipe. Knight's Errant of Eos is a slightly different inclusion as the card can't actually be hit off of Coco, but can be powered out via Convoke. If you're able to tap just two creatures to pay for the knight, you can grab most of our deck, specifically Amalia and Wild Growth Walker. This adds a way for the deck to play around cards like Spell Pierce and Dovin's Veto in order to dig through its library to find its combo pieces. With a couple of the flex spots out of the way, let's talk about lands in the Amalia deck because those have pretty much been solved as far as to how many of each to run with very little room for variety. Four copies of Overgrown Tomb and Temple Garden are the shock lands of choice for the deck, while four mana confluence make up a painful way to ensure you always have access to all three of your colors. Four copies of Razor Verge Thicket and three copies of Blooming March are your fast lands for the deck, as you have zero one mana block spells in your main deck, so the white green source is more valuable. One basic planes is in the deck to be able to cast the single mana life gain creatures and work towards the double right requirement of return to the ranks, while the mana base rounds out with two channel lands, one copy of Buseju who endures to double as removal for hate pieces, and one copy of Takanuma Abandoned Mire to get back creatures we need in a pinch. 
Now there are lists that may replace a Razor Verge Thicket with another Selesnia colored monosaur, such as Scattered Groves for the small upside of cycling or finding it off of opposing Baseju, but the entering tapped part can come back to bite you. Now, if you thought the main deck was a little bit of a mess, sideboarding with Amalia is not only a puzzle in and of itself to put the sideboard together, but when it comes to actually putting cards in and taking cards out in the middle of a match, it can be difficult to balance when running a deck that is both combo centric and a collected company shell. Remember the number of creatures you want for all of your Cocos to hit consistently, and don't be afraid to take some Cocos out if you go lower than that number of creatures. As any good black base deck will tell you, Fatal Push and Thoughtseize are all but mandatory in the Pioneer format. Fatal Push answers creature threats that put the pressure on us too quickly, but can also deal with ways that our opponents will punish our deck, such as Rampaging Ferocidon. You can just tap a Gilded Goose, sacrifice the food for mana, it triggers Revolt, and then you get rid of the Rampaging Ferocidon and can then gain life again and don't take damage for playing creatures. Thoughtseize is the best way for us to combat control decks and interaction for our combo, snagging a key piece of interaction to pave the way to victory. Similarly to Thoughtseize, Sin Collector is a creature we can tutor for in a pinch to combat instants and sorceries our opponents may have to stop us from executing our game plan. Of note, the spell is exiled forever when Sin Collector resolves, so getting rid of it for our own needs like Ruthless Lawbringer doesn't matter to us, so that Sin Collector is expendable. Even Interrupter is another way to deal with problematic spells, but this time when they're on the stack. Doing its best spell queller cosplay, the Bird Rogue exiles a spell and plots it making counter magic useless as plotted spells can only be played at sorcery speed. It also taxes the spell by two additional mana, meaning the plotted spell isn't free to recast. High Noon is another non-creature spell that can really put a damper on the other combo decks, as well as decks like Prowess or Phoenix that want to chain spells together in a turn. Although this effect is symmetrical, we can take advantage of our collected companies and quarter callings being instant speed to punish an opponent for trying to progress the board on their own turn. Voice of Resurgence is a creature-based way to punish our opponents for interacting with us on our turn, making an elemental token for each spell they cast on our time. These quickly add up since they have power and toughness equal to the number of creatures we control, and we have a lot of little dudes, so forcing our opponent to decide between dealing with the tokens or dying to our combo is the role that Voice plays. Redain, God of the Worthy, also looks to punish these decks by making all of their non-creature spells that are 4 mana or greater, aka all of their board wipes and combo payoffs, cost 2 additional mana. This is an asymmetrical effect, so it has no effect on our own cords and cocos. Additionally, Redain can be used to play the flip side, Valkymira Protector's Shield, in order to give all of our creatures pseudo ward 1 and prevent some damage from spells that might usually one-shot them like Torch the Tower. Knight of Dusk Shadow is a tutorable way to shut off life gain in the mirror, as well as stopping Vein Ripper decks from having their life total climb out of reach of a single Amalia swing. Haywire Might is a sideboard creature that comes in when you expect hate pieces you can exile with its effect, but it also gains life while sacrificing itself. This allows you to clear the way and combo at the same time. Likewise, Scavenging Ooze is a card that can be used as our own graveyard hate for decks like Is It Phoenix, with the upside of us gaining life when it exiles a creature. That of course means we can also exile our own creatures in order to start a loop with life gain too. Of Salvation and Temio Safekeeping are options for protecting our combo from disruption effects, with Surge of Salvation playing double duty at protecting us from targeted discard spells like a Veil of Summer could in other formats. Get Lost comes in as a removal spell that deals with not just large threats, but can also remove enchantments like Rest in Peace or Leyline Binding on some of our combo pieces. Some decks even look to go much more mid-range after sideboarding, with some of them including cards like Wedding Announcement and Liliana of the Veil vale in their 15 card sideboards. Wedding Announcement works to pump up our entire team, turning our low enablers into semi-legitimate threats, while Liliana allows us to keep combo and control players low on resources, while we have many ways of getting our own discarded cards back from the graveyard. 
Lastly, you'll see most lists adding in a few extra copies of some of their own flex slot cards into the sideboard, making sure that there are additional copies at hand for the games where they're really solid. With the actual list out of the way, let's go back over some play patterns you might encounter with your Amalia deck. Now your quickest way to kill is going to be any combination of turn 3 plays that result in comboing off for a win, either because you naturally play a Lunar Veteran into Amalia into Wild Growth Walker, or because you collected company into pieces with a Gilded Goose mana and then make a food and eat it later on to gain life another way. However, the quick kill isn't always going to be how to play the deck every single game, and you're most likely going to be playing a little bit slower and wait for an opportunity to combo instead of brute forcing it every single time. This may involve you playing a more normal mid-range appearing game with a couple of turns deploying your enablers and setting up your mana base and hand to fight through interaction. These games are where your flex spots and your three mono creatures really shine, as you're going to have to be applying some form of pressure to get your opponents to commit something to open the chance for you to win via combo. Deep Cavern Bat is also great in these types of games, as you can ensure the coast is clear to combo, while your opponent needs to try to remove the bat ASAP to get their potentially best answer to your combo back in their hand. Now there will be a non-zero number of games that you win without comboing, but to say you can win easily this way is not really true. Now Amalia still functions with all your other life gain creatures and can put up a fast clock on her own, and you may end up using your Court of Calling to clear a path for damage in these specific circumstances. In general, you need to be able to identify when you're the beatdown deck and when you really need to hold cards to play for the combo plan. See, it's easy to know you have to board wipe a fast Vein Ripper, but harder to know if you can win a mid-sized Amalia swinging in if you just remove the Ripper itself. Now that all being said, it's still probably better to mulligan an average hand of 7 cards in favor of a more combo-centric plan. You also don't have a ton of natural card advantage in the deck, so hands without all of your color sources are also fast mulligans. Keeping a medium 7 is often not good enough as finding a strong combo 5 could be. The Amalia combo deck is one of the main reasons why aggro decks got pushed out of the metagame for a little while and had to adapt, therefore it will have solid matchups against any creature based deck, especially those that want to try to go wide. Turns out destroying all creatures is pretty good against those decks. Additionally, Amalia is solid against other combo decks like Lotus Field Combo, as our deck can win the turn that they're putting their namesake land into play tapped. This extends to softer definitions of combo decks as well, with Amalia beating up on both versions of Izzet decks in the metagame, Phoenix and Creativity. The deck is also great against Waste Knot, as we can not only recur the cards that we lose to Disruption, but our spells utilize our library and the top of our deck two places they can't touch. Decks that can interact with the Amalia deck are going to be a little bit harder to beat consistently, but they aren't unwinnable matchups. Due to the redundancy that we have in our deck, removing our threats once or even twice sometimes is not enough to stop us. Therefore, decks like Rakdos Vampires, Enigmatic Incarnation, and even the Niv to Light Shell are closer to even than you might think they'd be. Decks that are faster than we are at applying a clock to our life total can be an issue because we sometimes have to mulligan to lower card total hands that can't answer everything they do. Additionally, these decks have adapted ways to quote unquote break our Amalia combo by giving her extra power and forcing a drawn game and a redo. Decks like Mono Red Aggro, Girl Prowess, and Boros Heroic can force rematches until we end up with a slower hand than theirs ending in a loss for us. In a similar vein, Azorius Control is one of our worst matchups because it can contain our game plan and prevent us from ever establishing a board, let alone our combo, and slowly grinding us to dust with their powerful planeswalkers. Most of their spells exiling our stuff makes our redundancy a dud and makes it hard for us to win on pretty much all fronts. As a combo deck, Amalia is going to take very few games to learn how to actually do the combo part, but then the real trick is learning when you're safe to do so. 
playing out a lot of matches to learn things like when to cord for calls like Dina to kill faster, or when it's safe to pull the trigger on your collected company are going to take a little while to learn for each different deck in the format that you will face. I know I usually like to give out kind of an estimated amount of how many matches you should play with the deck before taking it to an RCQ environment, but I think with a deck like Amalia, you can actually get a lot of practice by just goldfishing to find your lines while playing uninterrupted. And then you can figure out how to do these same exact scenarios with pressure as you play online or at your LGS. Because of this, you may only really need to play a few weeks of FNMs or a handful of Magic the Gathering online leagues to get some of your play patterns down pat and feel confident on the deck, but that doesn't mean that the deck is easy to pick up and just wipe an RCQ with. You'll learn to master it as you enter more competitive events and play against top tier decks repeatedly and sometimes, you know, get your ass beat a little bit. But it's a learning experience. So is the Amalia combo your type of deck? How do you feel about the power level of the combo and are you looking to pilot it yourself or kind of stop it in its tracks this RCQ season? Let me know how you feel down in the comments below and while you're down there, feel free to thumbs up the video if you'd enjoyed it as it helps me survive a board wipe from a 20 power Amalia due to the YouTube algorithm gods. Also, make sure to tap that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on the latest deck techs, metagame analysis, and in general, Magic the Gathering content from me. See you later. Take this